That was a 17.6% increase. Now we're talking about for electricity, for electricity specifically, 27.2% increase in tariffs. Now take a look at this. The next is our focus on how the situation has been with respect to the increases that we have seen over the period. Now, for Ghana Water, they were asking the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, PURC, to increase water tariffs by 334%. That was the proposal that they sent, right? And then the approved tariff is 21.5%. That's what the PRC approved. Remember, the fact that they were asking doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get it. Now, after the nationwide consultation, PRC approved 21.5. What we're hearing from the water company, Ghana Water Company, is that they are not happy. They are really not happy about this 21.5%. And guess what? Consumers are also complaining that the 21.5% is too much. So both the utility companies and the consumers are not happy. Electricity Company of Ghana went with a proposal of 148%. The approved tariffs for ECG is 27.15%. Now, bear in mind, the ECG loses about 3.2 billion CDs to power theft, that is illegal connections and all other operational losses. And so taking all of that into consideration, the PRC said, you know what, we're going to give you 27.15%. That is what has been approved for the Electricity Company of Ghana as against the 148% that they were asking for. Okay? But in all of this, ECGs as well, they are not happy. They were expecting something more than the 27.5% the, the that has been given to them. But how about the consumers, the consuming public? They've been reacting to this. Whereas we're also monitoring how the Public Utilities Regulatory Committee, indeed, the utility tariffs have also impacted on the utility companies, listen to some of the consumers on the streets. We need quality water. We need uh, this in our energy system, whatever. Everything, we need the best. But looking at the, the cost of living in the country now, now, you see, if government cannot subsidize and then for the uh, citizens, then it means that um, we, 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 we don't know what our leaders are in for. Since we've not gotten any increment in our salaries and all that, it's really affecting us. I think they have to reduce it for us, if it will be possible. The government must do something about it because the Ghanaian people, we are suffering. Okay. If you buy your prepaid, within a moment of time, it gets finished and we are really suffering. And there's no work in the country to the increment of water and electricity bills is a problem for especially those who stay alone and pay rent and moreover to, it's not everyone's income that is increasing so this increment is sort of a problem for me the cost of living in, in this country is it's, it's even getting high so uh, Ghana water increasing uh, their, their, their tariffs and stuff like that is really affecting us I try. well those are some consumers complaining about these tariffs. I'm going to run you through the increases that have been announced so you understand how, how this is going to impact on you beginning September 1. But these are the prevailing tariffs and then the new tariffs. It's going to be on the screen right now. Then we'll do the calculation. The prevailing tariffs as we have it now for the lifeline customers. The lifeline customers are the very, very poor people. Very poor people in society who have maybe one light one, uh, that's one bulb, and they don't even have a fridge or an standing fan, okay? That's the lifeline, and they consume between 0 and 30 kilowatts per hour. Now, the current tariff is 32 pesos, 32.6 pesos. Now, if you multiply, to get to know how much this lifeline tariff that's bracket is paying the very, very poor people. Multiply the old tariff, that's 32.6 pesos, that's 0.32, multiplied by the 30 kilowatts. So the upper limit is 30 kilowatts. Multiply by 30. Okay? So 
that's 0 0.32, right, by the 30 kilowatts. So you multiply the total of the tariffs by the kilowatts. Then you have 9 cities, 60 pesos. So that's how much the lifeline consumers, those who don't have money, really very, very poor people in society are paying. This is 9 cities, 60 pesos a month. That's how much they are paying now. With the increase that has been announced, it's even affecting this lifeline people as well. Now, according to the PRC, the new tariffs, which is 41 pesos, 41, just about 42 pesos thereabout, is gone up from 32 pesos for the lifeline people to 41 pesos. Now, to know how much the lifeline, very poor people are going to pay, you multiply this as well by the 30 kilowatts, okay? So that is, for the pesos, is 0 0.41 times 30. That's 12 CDs, 30 pesos. 12 CDs, 30 pesos. If you subtract 9 CDs, 60 pesos, that's what they were paying earlier, or they are paying now. So from September 1, they are going to pay 12 CDs, 30 pesos. That's the very, very poor people in society. 12 CDs, 30 pesos a month. You subtract, that's 12 CDs, 30 pesos, minus 9 CDs, 60 pesos. You have 2 CDs, 70 pesos difference. So for the lifeline, their tariff has actually gone up by 2 CDs, 70 pesos, effective September 1. Now take a look at this. They are not only paying this 12 CDs, 30 pesos. There's actually a service charge, service charge of Two, two pesos, thereabout. So if you add the service charge to the tariff calculation I've just done, then you get to know how much you're paying in total. That's for the lifeline, very poor people. Let's go to the non-residential that is outside of the lifeline. That is you and I who consume beyond 12 CDs, 30 pesos a month. That's what you see there. All other residential customers, that's you and I, beyond the 30 pesos that's the lifeline 12 cities, 30 pesos. Now, to do this calculation, take the old tariff. How much you are paying now if you're consuming between 0 and 300 kilowatts? Between 0 and 300 kilowatts per hour. Multiply the old tariff of 65 pesos. The old tariff 65.41, you see that is in pesos. So 0 0.65 by 300, that's 300 kilowatts. That is if you are consuming the upper limit of 300. So you do 0 0.65 by 300, you are getting 195 CDs. Bear in mind, this 195 CDs is, is not the total you're gonna pay. You are actually gonna pay service charge. The service charge is charged by the utility companies and then you pay street light levy as well. Street light levy is, is on this. So you're going to pay more than the 195. Even though some of us, you pay the street light levy and the street lights in your community are not working. But you're going to pay for it. So if you are, for instance, consuming, the bracket is between 0 and 300 kilowatts per hour. So if you're consuming, say, let's do um, nine, 200 kilowatts. 200 kilowatts per hour. What you're going to do is this. You multiply, and look at your receipt. If you go and buy prepaid, they will, it's there. The total kilowatts per hour you consume. So look at your receipt, and look at the kilowatt hours you consume, and multiply it by the current 0.65, you will get to know how much you're paying, plus the service charge, and then the street light levy. Now, currently, the proposed increase by the PRRC means that, take a look at this. This, this is your, what you're paying now if you're consuming 300, or the 200 now is 195. Per the proposed tariffs, the consumers between zero and 300 bracket are now going to pay, has gone up from 65 pesos to 89 pesos, right? So you now multiply 
300, that is if you are consuming the upper limit, or anything between 0 and 300 kilowatts per hour, check your receipt, you'll see it. So for instance, if you're consuming 250 kilowatts per hour, you multiply it by 89 pesos, 0 0.89. You get to see how much you're going to pay beginning September 1. That is 0 0.89 by 250. You get 222 Ghana cities, 222.5 cities, plus the street light levy and the service charge. So it's going to go up to maybe about 230, 235 cities. Okay. As against if you were doing the calculation now with the current tariffs, you multiply the 250 kilowatts by 0 0.65. This is the prevailing tariff. So to know the difference, now we do 0 0.65. If you are consuming, that's 250. So 0 0.65 times 250, that's 162. 162.5 Ghana cities. So if you subtract this from this, you get to know your increase. So if the new tariff takes effect from September 1, if you were consuming 250 kilowatts per hour, now you're going to be paying 222 minus 162, an additional 60 Ghana cities. 60 cities additional if you're consuming 250 kilowatts. So all I want you to do is, so take a look at the chart. Take a look at the chart. Now look at the bracket, and I'm going to put it on the screen right now. Look at the bracket. That's the customer category, which is 0 to 300, or 300 to 600, or 600 kilowatts upwards. You look at the old tariff, you multiply that tariff, that's what you see on the screen. You multiply that tariff by the number of the, the kilowatt hours that you consume. What you're seeing now is the small and medium scale enterprise, the small, small businesses, that's the non-residential customers. What's happened now with the PRC's new announcement is that the SMEs are going to pay lesser than the residential customers because they're saying that they are making it convenient for the SMEs to thrive. So if you do the calculation, you realize that now you and I, who consume between 0 and 300 kilowatts, will be paying more than the hairdresser and the beauty parlors, the saloon, barbering shops, tailoring and dressmaking shops, etc. Those small, small businesses. Now, the people who consume electricity in their homes, we're actually going to pay more. Another concern that came up was that even though there may be very poor people who have one light, that's one bulb, standing fund, and they are supposed to be in the poor brackets, that is the lifeline, and they are living in a compound house, maybe six poor people in a compound house, if they are all consuming electricity from one meter, they will go beyond the lifeline, and so they will not enjoy it. I asked the PRC Executive Secretary, Dr. Ishmael Aka, how they're going to calculate to make sure that the poor people in a compound house would actually be classified under the lifeline. Take a look. So what are the factors you took into consideration in arriving at this increases in electricity and water tariffs you have just announced? We consider three main factors. The first one is the general macroeconomic conditions. Uh, these are conditions external to the utilities, exchange rate, inflation, and others. We also looked at um, the utility-specific factors, so their operations, investment needs, um, and other factors that are related to how you can operate sustainably, you can operate utilities. The final factor was the general conditions of the economy and how it's affecting the consumer's ability to pay. So these were the factors we considered in coming out with the tariff. Okay, so let me start from where you ended, the consumer's ability to pay. You did a nationwide consultation, went through all the 16 regions, and the Ghanaian people were quite clear in their language that times are hard, the economy is biting, and things are not looking good, and that any increase in electricity water tariffs will be burdensome to the people. We cannot pay. So to what extent did the feedback you got from the Ghanaian people feed into the decision to increase tariffs now? Yeah, so we did two main engagements. Uh, one was the general public engagement 
uh, we went around provide a platform for utilities to make presentations to consumers and after which the consumers also said and as you said right so that they, did, they were not expecting any increment not because they, they didn't think the utilities deserve increment but they believe that because of the general conditions they may not be able to pay so that was one after that we did what we call customer expectation survey to look at um, what customers expect and in fact some of them indicated that they will be uh, willing to accept some level of increment if utilities will improve their services. So any acceptance of increment was dependent on the utilities improving their services. So we looked at that. Now that influenced these two, apart from the factors I've considered, influence our decision in such a way that when you take, let's say, a utility like Ghana Water requesting for 300% increment, and we giving them 21%. What we did was that we took, let's say, the operation budget, operational budget and the capital budget. For the operational budget, we gave it to them. For the capital budget, we decided to disaggregate. So when you take, let's say, return on equity, we wanted to know the assets they are charging the, the return on equity on. So these assets were disaggregated into three. Assets that are owned and provided by government. Assets that are owned and provided by the utility themselves and assets that were provided by grants. So when you take those that were provided by government, government is the owner of Ghana Water, ACG and others. So if you want to pay return on equity, it has to go to the owner. So if the owner says that for this period, because of a number of reasons, I want you to zero my returns, then that can reduce um, whatever they proposed. Again, you take uh, online loans. Government gave them some online loans. So, and they, they, some of them started paying. But if government says for the period, because of these conditions, I don't want you, I don't want them to pay over this period. But after when things become better, then they, they start paying. So we did a number of balancing acts uh, to ensure that, yes, the utilities can get something, one, to remain solvent, to operate and serve us better. At the same time, also not overburdening the consumer, who is also experiencing the same conditions, inflation and others, which the utilities are facing, the consumer is also facing. So that is what we did to arrive at this figure. Well, there, there are many who hold the view that, look, th this increase you have just announced is insensitive to the plight of the Ghanaian people now because of the economic situation that we find ourselves in and how people are struggling to make a living. One choice was that we are not to do anything and let's say from next year, not get any water at all in our taps. Because Ghana Water now spends more than four times what they were spending seven years ago to treat water, raw water, because of Galamse. ECG need to change a number of transformers so that we can have stable power. So either we don't get anything, zero, so that maybe by next year we can have some low shedding and others. That was one option. Another option was that despite all the challenges we are facing, can we contribute something so that the utilities will be able to do some of these minor and major investment to continue to serve us better. So we had these two choices, and we believe that the continuous uh, provision of service uh, to the Ghanaian is more important, and that is why we did. And to minimize the impact, that is why, look at somebody requesting 300, and you giving 21. I think that is why we went that far to cut to that level. Well, you see, how about the operational losses? ECG, for instance, loses 3.2 billion cities to power theft, illegal connection, and so on and so forth. You can talk about Water Company Limited as well, where you see a number of pipe bursts, water is flowing uncontrollably. To say that have a point, a valid point, but it is not entirely the case. In economic, we say that economy, we say it is necessary, but not sufficient enough. The reason being that one, the losses come in two forms. We have the commercial losses, which you just described, and we have the technical losses. The technical losses, almost every utility experience some form of losses. At the commercial le level to, yes, uh, people are stealing power, the pipes busting and, and other, which we believe are very, very serious matter, and we've written to all utilities to address them. 
But what we do at PURC is to give them benchmarks. So for Greco, for instance, your loss benchmark is 4.1%. And these benchmarks were given after a study of the system. We did a number of studies. We even looked at comparative institutions. So the distribution company in, say, Côte d'Ivoire, in South Africa, ESCOM, and other, other places. We looked at all those ones, and we also looked at the trend, how ECG has been reducing the losses over the past 10 years, or even increasing the losses over the past 10 years, before we can come out with such a benchmark. Now, if you give you a benchmark of 4.1% loss, and you go and make a loss of 8%, we will just take into consideration only the 4.1. If you had postponed this announcement of an increment in the utility and uh, tariffs, what would have happened? Two things. Uh, one is law. So PURC Act provides certain timelines. If utilities submit their proposals after analysis and you accept them, the law gives you not more than 30 days to announce. So that is the first one. So there's a, more like a law giving us a timeline which you cannot go against. And somebody can actually sue us if we do that. The second is the current condition of most of the utilities. Yes, uh, we are all suffering. The utilities, are, some of them are struggling to provide even meters. So if we go, because the last time we did adjustment was 2018. And even in that adjustment, we reduced tariff. We reduced residential tariff by 17.5%, industrial tariff by 30%. We used an SJ rate of less than five, five, five cities. Now we've moved to uh, like 2018 to 20, about four years now. Things have changed. Economic conditions, other things, some of them took loans. And some utilities cannot even take loans because they can't repay and all those things. So as I said, we had that difficult decision that should we delay, should we move, maybe next year things will be better and we do it. But can the utilities sustain themselves at that time? And against we had the law. So we had to do something. And that is what we've actually done. So are you saying that we would have actually rationed water if you had extended it? It would have led to a rationing of water and electricity? Yes. Yes, because as I said, uh, when we're doing the adjustment major tariff review in 2018, Ghana water, if you go and check the figures, how much they were spending to, on chemicals to treat water, that amount is about times four now. You know, we've not changed the tariff. So the same revenue they got, expenditure has ballooned. So they are in a state where if you don't do anything about them, a the time will come we may not have it at all. I see. So meaning, we would have, for instance, had Dumso and maybe water would have been flowing consistently as we're experiencing now. Yes, I mean, if we don't do anything about these situations. But how about the currency depreciation, the CD depreciation against the dollar and other major trading currencies? How did that impact on this announcement? So I mentioned three factors that influence the tariff. The, the first one, the macroeconomic conditions, the CD is a major factor. Uh, the inflation is another major factor. So yes, they, they contribute a lot. But normally what we do is that instead of waiting till a major tariff review to capture all the depreciation and other things in the city, what we do is that we do quarterly adjustment. So that the changes in the exchange rate, we take them into consideration during the quarterly review. So by the time we get to the major review, we've already captured uh, most of those changes. So tell me about the lifeline consumers, within which bracket of people um, fall within this lifeline that you're talking about? And how do you determine who would fall within this lifeline of consumers that will not pay this increase you have announced? In the past, the challenge with the lifeline was that some of these people lived in compound houses. Because we look at how much you are consuming over time to determine this also. So if you have your meter, and maybe you live in your own room, you have one bulb and other things, maybe you are consuming this, your lifeline. Mm -hmm. But if you are in a compound house, and almost everybody is feeding on one meter, what it means is that you are going to consume above the lifeline target. So uh, some of these people in the lifeline compound, compound houses were paying more than even, let's say, a rich person who doesn't stay home, doesn't use power margin, all those things. 
We've drawn ECG's attention to that because we want to make the lifeline exclusive. Exclusive means that those who actually are lifeliners who enjoy the lifeline. So it's a major issue because you have a number of poor people, by the definition you have just given, living in a compound house and they are consuming one, one meter or using one meter. So if they are within the lifeline bracket, but they are in a compound house, and number one, don't benefit from this. They still have to pay the increase in the tariff. So how are you going to address that? So that is what I have identified the challenge. So what, going forward, ECG is going to have what we call load limiters and separate meters. So they are doing meter auditing now, and when they finish, they want to have what we call load limiters. That will show the target, how much you are consuming, and again, separate meters for individuals so that more, more people will not just feed on one meter. So we can distinguish between who is a lifeline and who is not a lifeline. So you're saying that the people who consume 12 CDs, 30 pesos a month of electricity. Yeah, so you are considered a lifeline. The challenge was that because we didn't have a way of making this exclusive to, let's say, those in that bracket, those who have, let's say, one bob. Because the, the intention of the lifeline is not just to encourage people not to consume. So maybe I'm rich and I'm um, using, let's say, 30. Uh, that makes me a lifeline. But we're looking at those who are using basic uh, electrical appliances who are unable to pay. They, they don't really have that much ability to pay. They are considered, when you look at the World Bank and GSS definition, they are considered, let's say, poor. So that is more like a social tariff to cushion those people. Uh -huh. So in the past, there was no way to distinguish between a poor person consuming 30 and a rich person consuming 30. Well, but how many people consume 12 to 30 pesos a month these days? I mean, do you have the figures and how, how many people will benefit from this assumption you are talking about? And that is what ECG is going to introduce what we call the load limiters. So, and targeting after the meter audit to ensure that if you are poor, you benefit from that. Okay, but for us, the consumers beyond this lifeline, how will this increase you have just announced apply? How would it be calculated? So, for instance, if I'm paying 100 CDs or 150 CDs a month for electricity, does that mean that the percentage increase in electricity tariffs would apply automatically if I calculate it in percentage terms or other charges will be added? Technically, yes. Uh, so if you are paying, so what we've done in the statement is that we've also even calculated. So this time we didn't focus more on the percentages, but on the figures. So if we were, if we were paying, let's say, 89 pesos per kilowatt hour, now you are going to, let's say, 115 or 113. So that multiplied by, let's say, how much you are consuming, you can have an idea of what you pay. Let me also say that the tariff is not the only cost. So there are certain taxes uh, government impose, including VAT, on some classes of consumers. So that one also uh, come into play. Then there are also some service charges which also come into play. So you have to add all those things. Uh, we're going to publish uh, what we call a recorder on our website, on how you can, an Excel, that will help people to, if you, are, if you are interested, go there and you just input it in and you can see how much you should pay. Well, so that's uh, Dr. Ishmael Aka. He is the Executive Secretary of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, PRC. Give me more detail on what exactly went into this decision to increase electricity and water tariffs at this time, especially because of the feedback they got nationwide that the economic situation that we have now is impacting on the Ghanaian people so much. An increase in tariffs may be detrimental, but they had to do it. They say to save the electricity companies as well. The calculation that I did is available. You can find it on that's 3 newscom Later on, also on, also on that's TV3 Ghana on Facebook, you can find all of that and get to understand how the tariff increase will impact on you eventually. But the West African Examinations Council, that's why it says it cannot install CCTV cameras in all examination centers, although it is working to improve security at its operation centers to prevent leakages of examination papers. I want to take a listen to the head of the national office at Daswaik, Wendy Adi Lamte, when she reacted to a suggestion that examination body should use CCTV cameras to tackle the menace. 
Thanks to CCTV camera desk, they are a very good way of monitoring the exams. But I guess you all know that it takes money. Um, when you go to our uh, white kites, etc., we have some installed there. Uh, if you travel to Pakistan and other places, they have mobile CCTV cameras in their examination halls, which they move around. Right now, I can't say we are going to do that because we don't have the, should I say, the money or the funds to do that. See, the, the reference is Pakistan. Pakistan actually has a system that's working for them. Now, Kofi Asari, Executive Director of the Africa Education Watch, he joins me via Zoom. He has been critical on matters of examination or practice that institution has done a lot for this country. But the responses has not been as expected. Kofi, good evening to you. Thank you for joining us on Ghana tonight. Hi, good uh, evening. Um, good evening to your audience. You heard WAEC. Yes, it's going to be expensive to install CCTV cameras in the examination centers, and um, that is these areas that the coalition centers are as well. That's where they able the, the distribution centers. I beg your pardon. So that's going to solve just one arm of the problem, isn't it? Because then before it even gets to the centers, the leakages would have taken place. Kofi? Well, um, let me indicate that on 30th of June, we sent a letter to the minister and then WAEC uh, for the ministry and WAEC to hold a stakeholders forum ahead of this year's WASI because there were issues to be discussed. And so we were happy that we heard that WAEC um, after, uh, finally convened the stakeholders forum, even though it decided not to invite us for obvious reasons. The issue in question, which is CCTV camera, was cameras was re, re, um, was captured in our was 2021 reports which we discussed with parliament and WIAC and the ministry on page 27 of that report recommendation three was for government to consider installing cctv cameras the reason is that whether questions leak or they do not leak, majority of the examination of practices takes place because YX external supervisors are either unavailable or they are compromised. Because they do not have the capacity to deploy external supervisors to every center during every paper. So it means that since your internal, uh, your invigilators are teachers who have an interest in the outcome of the exam, and it is common practice in many schools that head teachers are actually, you know, colluding with teachers and all the et cetera to let students cheat and pass because they have KPIs to meet. Then any failure in your external supervisory system means that you will need something inhuman, a technology that can supervise your external supervisor, supervise the policemen, supervise the invigilators who are sometimes compromised by the system. That is why we made the recommendation that CCTV cameras, which is best practice worldwide, should be introduced in our schools. If you have that, it will reduce the extent to which teachers will be able to teach. Teachers will not mount blackboard, uh, whiteboards and use markers to teach students as it happened in all for Christ in high school, after which WAEC decided to release their results to them. If you install CCTV cameras, it will also ensure that the practice of students smuggling mobile phones into the examination hall and copying from the mobile phones as teachers are on standby to, to, you know, to transfer the answers to their questions on these WhatsApp platforms on their phones cannot happen because it can be reviewed and ascertained. So having um, a last layer of security which is inhuman, which is technological, which cannot be compromised, obviously it's a good um, recommendation to consider. Of course, it will not be cheap, but how much does it cost to install, uh, uh, um, let's say 10 or 12 um, CCTV receiver in a, in a huge domination hall? It shouldn't mm -hmm. cost you more than 5,000 Ghana cities. So um, I don't see the challenge of CCTV to be, a, to be a cost issue. In any case, it is not for WAEC to determine whether they can afford it or not, because it is not, it is not WAEC, it is, a, it is the Ministry of Education that has the mandate to determine whether it can afford it or not, not WAEC. The issue that we have to work towards, I mean, the, 
the, the, the plan that we have to work towards is that introducing CCTV cameras in our examination halls will, 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 will have short-term challenges because not all schools have examination halls. Some of the low category schools mm -hmm. actually write their papers in the classrooms. So you find that in, a, in one particular school, there are about 10 classrooms where a core paper is written. In that case, it means that you will have to install four to six um, um, CCTV receivers in every classroom, which is not practical. So we need to develop infrastructure in our senior high schools to ensure that every senior high school has a dining hall. But normally, dining halls are used as an examination hall in the absence of a permanent examination hall. If we have examination hall or dining halls in all our senior high schools, it is feasible to have CCTV cameras installed in them. And it shouldn't cost, you know, an, an arm and a leg to do that. I see. So you, you raise the issue of commitment, right? Because, yes, any solution that's proposed would have a cost element to it. It, it is an issue of whether or not the institution that's why is, is committed to going on that path, regardless of the cost. I say commitment not just because of YAC's readiness to... YX's readiness to adapt this technology, but also readiness in respect of the political will of the system um, to, to, to frown and clamp down on people who break the law, especially YEC. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. If Africa Education Watch plants CCTV cameras in a particular school and then reports what took place in that particular school, and have and, and has I mean and, and have meetings with WIAC and Parliament and the Ministry of Education and the police in Kofoidia after the examination, present all this evidence to the team. And WIAC after that meeting will go ahead, organize its own investigation without involving African Education Watch, the organization that prevented presented the primary evidence of what took place in that school and goes ahead and then releases the results of that particular school, which is all for Christ Senior High Technical School. Then it means that the political will to hold people accountable for their actions, even in the face of overwhelming evidence, is not there. Hmm. Again, if Africa Education Watch will submit a compendium of rich information leading to people who are responsible for selling questions, including the WhatsApp platform of the all for Christ Senior High Technical School, which eventually we had a video documentary being, I mean, shown by Corruption Watch, confirming what we wrote in our report that indeed it took place there because they had the video evidence. Now, if after Africa Education Watch submitting evidence that all for Christ Senior High School was a hub of examination fraud and submitting all the information the police needs need to the Data General CID in September or October of last year, right? And we almost in September and not even a single arrest, not even a single prosecution has commenced, then it means that even if CCTV cameras are in the same school and it captures incriminating scenes, then it is not likely anything will happen. So that's why I mean the political will, the will of this, the system to hold persons responsible for ensuring that exams are held you know, in, 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 a, um, in accordance with the rules of conduct responsible. If you don't want to hold the people responsible and we have to chase you to hold the people responsible after going to dick for evidence of wrongdoing, then CCTV cameras will be there. They will capture wrongdoing, but nothing will happen. So it is about the will, you know, the, 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 the political will of the justice sector institutions, especially the Ghana Police Service, and then WAEC, you know, to, to, to pursue such actions. But for the Ministry of Education, as I keep saying, once the ministry has involved the BNI back to back, mm -hmm. In last year's BEC, they were involved, and in this year's um, examination, you know, I heard I heard that they were involved in the Borga Technical Institute, for instance. You know, they actually effected some arrests. So right. I am confident that bringing in external uh, supervisory systems um, by the Ministry of Education is enough testament that the ministry is ready it's to, ready. you know. Exactly, exactly. I see. Kofi, let's see how the coming days will look like on this matter because it's very, very important. It impacts on the credibility and sanctity of our, of our assessment system in this country. Thank you, Kofi, for your time this evening. Appreciate it. Pleasure.
Kofi Asari is the executive director of the Africa Education Watch. Uh, talking to me there. Now, it's about the issue of commitment. Because technology will only come in as a complementary factor to what has to be done by WAEC. But it's a cost to it. That's what they're concerned about. Let's deal with education. The University of Ghana Council has recommended that the hall master and senior tutor of Komoro Hall be relieved of their duties while management works with security agencies to investigate lax with clashes. Just a little over a week. Now, JCL presidents of both halls, that's Komo Hall and Mensa Saba Hall, should also be referred to the disciplinary committee for junior members for their actions and inactions leading to and after the riots, the council has also recommended that no events should be organized by students for the remainder of the academic year without express permission from the dean of students. Now, the, the videos of the riots is what you see. The number of cars were destroyed and the bust of Mensa Saba went missing. And there are reports that it has been found and others also believe that it has not. But that's, th those are the videos there. It's, it wasn't a very good sight to behold. And many called on the university authorities to crack the whip to serve as a deterrent. Now, Prince Esumedu is the uh, SLC president of the University of Ghana. He joins me on the telephone. Prince, good evening to you. Good evening. Great. Now, so we're just getting this news of the University Council's recommendations. So when is this supposed to be carried out? Is it immediately? It's with immediate effect. It's with immediate effect? Yes. Please. But tell me about the uh, situation on campus now, um, after this development. Oh, um, and um, the agencies are also doing their work to make sure that um, stability would um, continue to reign on campus. I see. And we understand that the recommendation also is that there should be no activities, no hall weeks, nothing by, by students. And, and as SRC president, I'm sure you're going to be getting some reactions, especially about this. So how do you intend to engage the other hall leadership? to be oh, on board. Issues like this are all about communication. God willing tomorrow, and engaging the dean of student affairs and other stakeholders involved. And at least this is the all that they are going to find them from um student related activity. And then the mother as the mother union for all students should be allowed and should be given a certain guideline to go back one or two updates. I see. And are you working with security agencies to identify the students behind these the, the riots which led to the destruction of property? Well, I, I think that um, the Office of the Pro Vice Chancellor of Academic and Student Affairs um, has released a system where only students at all who have um, an information about what triggered to that clash um, can um, get forward those information through that system and your identity will not be in hot, um, shown to the university community. So it's not needed to healthy, but the entire student public working hand in hand with other corporate courses and the security agencies to make sure that those who are involved in this act um, is the law and the regulations of the University of Ghana. Have any arrests been effected as yet? Oh, um, as for today, no. no. I see. And how about the Mensa Sabah's bust? Has it been found? Oh, not yet. The security agencies are still working to make sure they get the bust. John Mensa Sabah's bust is still missing? Yes, please. Wow. Right. Okay. The student of Mensa Sabah or the resident of Mensa Sabah or um, so far so good. The bus will be returned to them.
so they should um, keep calm, same as Commonwealth Hall to do, to keep calm, allow the protests to work. They should allow the security apparatus to work with management so that we can block such um, an, um, an incident up in the game in the subsequent days to come on campus. Right. Prince, thank you for this update. Prince Sumedu is the SRC president of the University of Ghana Lagon. Giving us the updates there. So that's the decision by the University Council. And uh, also, we understand the bust of John Mensa Saba has still not been found. But we'll, we'll leave it at that. And stay with us in our subsequent bulletins. We'll give you an update on that. But let's go to Kenya now. William Ruto has been elected president of Kenya after a keenly contested election following the declaration of the results. There are concerns that the post-election violence that characterized the 2007 polls could be reignited. That's, uh, those were the fears. I'm going to show you the, some of the videos um, also in pictures of what we got earlier and the concerns that were raised. And you, you take a look. Welcome back. You're still live here on Ghana Tonight. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Very interesting developments in Kenya. And even though the odds were against him, Deputy President William Ruto has been declared president-elect after about seven days of waiting. Now the Kenyan people know who their next president is. I've been joined via Zoom from Kenya. This is Eric Latif, who is a veteran journalist there with Spice FM in Kenya. Eric, thank you so much for joining us on Ghana Tonight in Ghana. Tell me about uh, the uh, atmosphere there after the declaration of the election, which I must say we understand four out of the seven commissioners stayed away and they did not associate themselves with the results. Just to give you an update, um, Yes, indeed. This afternoon in Nairobi, the Electoral Commission uh, declared William Ruto, who is the sitting deputy president, as the president-elect following uh, the election last week on Tuesday, the 9th of August. Um, his closest challenger is uh, veteran opposition leader Raila Odinga, who came in second, and the margin between them was about 233,000 votes. And, uh, yeah, just before this, the, before the declaration of the result, there was a fallout within the commission with four out of seven commissioners uh, distancing themselves from the result of this election. I see. And what has been the reaction after the declaration and how are people reacting to it on the streets of Nairobi and other parts of Kenya? Well, as you'd expect, uh, the supporters of William Ruto are elated. They're out in the streets celebrating uh, its jubilation in his strongholds, uh, whereas the supporters of Raila Odinga are deflated. They were all uh, ready and out in the streets, hoping that this was going to be the one opportunity that Raila Odinga uh, clinches the presidency. This was his fifth attempt at uh, the presidency. He started the first time was in 1997. And then in 2007, 2013, 2017, and again this time. So they were out, ready to celebrate, but uh, when the developments unfolded, uh, they went back. Largely, it's been peaceful. Of course, you expect a few um, individuals to express themselves in a not-so-toward um, uh, way. So there were just a few areas where people were out in the streets, torching tires, but it's largely contained. It's peaceful tonight. So that was an earlier conversation that I had with Eric Latif, who is a senior journalist with Spice FM in Kenya. And despite the pockets of violence recorded there, it's been largely peaceful. And follow us on our various social media handles. We're monitoring what's happening in there and our subsequent bulletins as well. Thank you for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, we appreciate your company. I am Alfred Akonsi. Good night.
This program is rated PG. It contains scenes of brief nudity, mild violence, and strong language. Parental guidance is advised. Oh girl, I wanna be with you But you know they got enough time for me I wanna live with you uh, I get the reason why I can't let go Girl, you never know, so don't come pass up Man, them so far, they find your love Girl, you never know, so don't come pass up Man, them so far, they find your love Girl, you never know, so don't come pass up Man, them so far, they find your love Hello Ghana, this is Confessions on TV3. My name is Miss Nancy and on this show you get to hear all the social issues and some to see what from home and some can see this particular story. I'm just blown away. We need to listen and know that she told her partner and let go of her marriage, her beautiful family life and the lies she is projecting to the society. What does she do? Does she keep the secret? until death comes in. What actually does she do? I have these wonderful people here with me in the studio to do justice to this conversation. And a fine medical doctor is also here to give us his opinion, medical opinion, professional opinion about the situation. This is Confessions. Do not go away, we'll be right back. She is a woman, she is a wife, she is a mother, and she has a confession. I am here to listen to her confession. It is soothing, it is distressing, it does something to your soul if you are able to tell your sins and your ills. You are welcome to Confessions on TV3. Thank you for having me, Miss Nancy. Let's listen to your story. <laughs> I've been happily married for more than six years now, mm -hmm. but the first four years were, were kind of hard. Okay. First year during my marriage, I couldn't conceive. Okay. I wasn't so worried because it was just the first year. Of course, the honeymoon so, season, yes. right? Yes, but then the second, the third, still nothing. I decided to go and see a doctor. Okay. He said there was nothing wrong, and there was no problem, so mm -hmm. he, he recommended that my husband should also come and check himself. Of course. And he, according to my husband, he says he already has a first kid, so he's fine, there's nothing wrong with him. Mm -hmm. And during those years, I was having pressure from, my, from his family, even from the society. Of course. I felt this pressure. I even mm. got depressed at some point. Oh, I no. really had to mm. give him a child, like everybody was suspecting. And you needed one yourself Yes, too. yes. And I love my husband so much, I mm. wanted to make him happy as yeah. well. So, one thing led to the other. My, our driver, actually, he was very nice, and we began to flex, my driver and I. Mm. And we kind of got intimate. Your driver? Yes. Started flirting with you or you started flirting with him? I would say because of the pressure that was coming to me, I gave in. He, he made was... advances at you? I would say yes. Whoa. Yes. That is some very confident driver um, I who can hit on his madam. I, I, I was kind of on my low point. So yeah. he, according to what I saw, he was being nice to me. At that point, I wasn't thinking of he flirting with me. I just but wanted somebody. But he was somebody just a shoulder 